specialize in. Uh, we're gonna talk about something called turbine curtailment, which is gonna you know, be about if you drive by a wind farm on the highway or something and you see, you can say, there's wind outside, but the, the wind turbines aren't, turbines aren't spinning. Why aren't they spinning? We'll talk about why that is. Uh, we'll talk about how climate change relates to the building industry. And then I'm gonna try to crank through this a little bit faster than I did on the last one so you guys don't have to ask questions because we're gonna have juniors and seniors and everything. So I think you guys are gonna be a little bit more engaged and perhaps have more questions than me. So I'll try to go a little bit quicker for you. So we started, yeah, I'm Jack Person. Transmission is about long distance. 
ultra high voltage, long distance transmission of energy. Uh, so we, we produce the energy and then it goes into substation. So I can look at the next one here. Uh, we, we, we produce the energy and then it goes to these substations that step up the voltage. What that means is, uh, in broad terms, I'm not an electrical engineer, uh, but they, they raise the voltage and then lower the current, which means that there's an awful lot of energy traveling relatively relatively, quote unquote, slowly um, in comparison to a low voltage, high current uh, uh, electric transmission. Uh, the reason we, we run uh, electricity high, high voltage across long distances is because uh, high voltage, low current means you lose less energy to resistance and things like that. So it's much more efficient for long distance transmission, but it is very, very dangerous for actual usage. You do not want, we're, we're, we're talking 500,000 volts is, is the long distance talking very low voltage, you know, tens of volts or hundreds of volts as in home or business setting. Uh, so those steps up and steps out are, are huge. Um, and so uh, it goes from transmission lines to these, these network switching stations. Those, uh, I'll show you a map, um, are run by ISOs, independent service operators or regional transmission operators. They're responsible for balancing the grid. I'll talk about what balancing the grid means. Um, and then it, it goes to set down transformers that steps down the voltage to usable human levels. Um, and then they go through distribution lines like you see out here to your school or to your house or to wherever. Um, this, so a, a lot of the reference material I have in the slideshow is in relation to Texas specifically. It's for two reasons. One, we have a big, uh, we have a big presence in Texas, so I just have a lot of data and a lot of reference material from Texas. Um, the other reason being, Texas is a little bit of an interesting case. A few decades ago, uh, when you know a lot of this Grid infrastructure was being, uh, uh, you know, improved and scaled out as you know, the United States grew and population grew and cities got more and energy needs grew. Um, Texas kind of threw a fit and decided we don't want to be involved with all the rest of y'all. So for the most part, the grid for the rest of the United States is pretty interconnected. Texas is completely standalone. That's what ERCOT is. ERCOT is uh, electri electricity reliability commission or council. One of those electricity reliability commission. And that is the entity that is responsible for the Texas grid and, and balancing the Texas grid. Um, in this case here, it, it's pretty much the same picture as the slide before, but I like that this one has a breakdown for the state of Texas of how much energy we're talking and what the breakdown is. You see, Texas is still at about 60% coal and gas, which are the really big non-renewable sources. Uh, they've got a couple nuclear plants, um, which make up a little less than 5%, and then uh, wind and solar, Together, we're, we're talking somewhere between 30 and 35 percent in Texas. Uh, nationally, I want to say, don't quote me on this, this is a rough estimate, I want to say nationally wind energy by itself accounts for maybe 17 percent, 15 to 17 percent of, of energy usage in the United States. Um, and that is up 15 percent in the last 15 years. If you go back to like 2007, 2008, wind was maybe only 2 percent. Um, we're seeing a massive, massive growth year percent of total market share per year. That is a huge growth of uh, renewable energy in the United States, which is very exciting. Uh, and then we talk about these high voltage transmission lines. In Texas alone, you've got 46,500 miles worth of, of transmission lines, about 5,000 substations, and all of that feeds energy to about 26 million people in Texas. So uh, the ISOs, these are the people responsible for balancing the grid. Um, like I said, Texas, most of Texas, a little bit of middle Oklahoma, is on this grid that kind of stands by itself. These other colored portions are different uh, regional authorities for balancing the grid. Balancing the grid meaning, uh, I don't want to get too much into energy storage, but the, the short version is uh, energy storage is a big, big challenge at utility scale. It is either really expensive, really uh, space inefficient, like this, this hydroelectric storage where they store the water up high, uh, and then when they want to reproduce that energy and take advantage of it, they, they let it flow down and use gravity to drive you know, rotors that, that generate energy. But that takes up a lot of space. You're talking about storing a lot of energy. Um, and if you think about you know, like a lithium ion battery, uh, that technology is kind of coming around to where it's safe, but I mean, the lithium ion battery in your like phone, for instance, is pretty volatile. That's a very small battery. You talk about scaling that up to you know thousands and thousands and thousands of megawatts uh, you know, to power cities and power countries. That's a lot of really volatile chemicals that can be very, very dangerous. Um, and so, 
now is that because we can't store all that energy efficiently right now, uh, the energy coming into the grid has to roughly equal the energy going out. Because if we have too much energy, it puts a lot of load on the infrastructure, uh, which can potentially cause damage, cause failures, things like that. In extreme cases, you know, you can get these massive surges at like a substation or something and you can see explosions, that sort of thing. Um, and on the flip side, if the energy coming in is not enough to supply all the energy going out, uh, you know, you will get outages at your home. Or, you know, uh, you know we, we, we probably had outages here. We just had, did anybody have power out uh, with the ice storm in the last couple of weeks? Yeah. Um, that's because pieces of the grid went down or were damaged. Um, and when that energy can't be supplied, you, you can't put it away. Um, so I work, I work a lot with ERCOM. I work a lot with KISO, the California ISO. I work a lot with AESO, which is in Alberta. And I work a lot with uh, IESO. Uh, we have some involvement in these other areas here. We have a few of we have a few sites here, a few sites over here. Um, but those four make up the bulk of you know the entities I interact with on my day to day. And then you'll also notice there's these, these huge swaths down here and over here when there is no ISO. Those areas are kind of it's a, it's a big frustration for me and my team at work right now. Um, those areas are kind of for you know it's it's funny to say because it literally is the west. It's, it's kind of the wild west. Um, there are lots of smaller RTOs. For instance, Arizona has APS, Arizona Public Service, Arizona Public Service, um, that is responsible for balancing the grid in that area. But their their standards, their, their data standards, their regulation, all that stuff is not as tightly controlled as the ISOs. And so the data we get from them and the, the interaction we have with them is much less uh, efficient and causes some problems. Uh, I don't really have any knowledge or indication of how these ISOs are expanding or, or how, uh, how those uh, regulations are changing, but they are very, very slowly changing. A lot of these things are, are pretty entrenched. Um, these are some, some real life photos of uh, the different pieces of the puzzle. These, this is some wind turbines on a wind farm that's up in uh, uh, Canada, northern British Columbia at, at our site, Miko. This is all the way up here in British Columbia. Uh, this, this is where we're producing the energy. This is one of those. Uh, substations at one of our sites uh, that does the, the step up, the voltage step up for the transmission line. This is an example of a of, uh, one of the structures that those transmission lines will run through. Um, these are much, much, much bigger than like the distribution lines you see out here. You might see things like this from the highway um, in like big open farmland kind of areas. If you were to get out of your car and walk up to one, and then the same goes for, for wind turbines, like you look at it from the highway and you're like, oh, they're pretty big. If you step out and you actually got close to one, they're massive. They're extremely, extremely huge. Uh, this is an example of another distribution line like you see out here. And then this is, anybody see one of these outside of their house? Anybody know what it is? So this, this is a, a meter. So the, the uh, energy, the, the line runs from a distribution line in your neighborhood to this thing outside of your house. This is the entry point for all energy you use in your home. And what this does is it essentially tracks how much energy flows through it to know how much energy have you used. And then historically, we have what was called a meter reader. It's somebody whose job was to literally walk around neighborhoods, go from house to house, look at the meter. You see somebody like creepily walking around outside your home, what are they doing in my yard? They were reading the meter to see how much energy is. They would write it down. That's how you got bills. We're, uh, we're slowly moving more towards smart meters that you know report these things automatically to these computers and whatnot. Um, but they, they essentially it was the same way. It's a, it's a, it's a tracker for, for how much energy you use in your home. So let's talk about wind turbines. Like I said, wind turbines are really, really big. This just says the uh, turbine time I'm picking is tall and the support field is long. Um, the average, so there's a, a variety of different uh, turbine manufacturers and a variety of different turbine sizes. And when I say size, I mean size, like literal physical size and also production capacity size, how many megawatts can they produce. Um, the bulk of our fleet is uh, GE, so General Electric, and Siemens 2.3, so I mean 2.3 megawatt turbines. And those range from, I think, 89 meters tall, which is roughly a football field, to about 114. Um, and so you're, you're looking at about, about a football field tall here, about half a football field of these blades. Has anybody ever seen uh, like a blade being transferred, or being transported on the highway? Yeah, pretty, pretty huge, right? Uh, made for scale, you can see just a, a full, I think that's a Chevy Silverado, if I remember correctly. It's, it's, a, it's a full truck down here. Um, so it's, it's, they're, 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 they're very large. I still am not over how big they are. This is a smaller turbine than that. Um, this is a couple other photos for scale. So this is, I think this is at Western Spirit, which is one of our sites out in California, when it was being built. These are people up on the body of the, uh, this. These, 
is the blade, this is called the hub, and this whole section here is called the nacelle, um, and then the, the, the stalk, this is called the tower. Um, to get up to the top of a wind turbine, if you're a technician working on one of these things, you, there's a you know, stairs, you can go up to the little door, and on the inside there's essentially a series of ladders you have to harness in, and there's like a, an assisted climbing, so there's like an, an elevator and a ladder or sort of at the same time. You have to put in a little bit of effort, but it does most of the work for you. Uh, and so that's, that's how you get into a turbine. We talked about the anatomy of a turbine. Again, I will probably, I am not an electric engineer, I'm a data engineer. Um, so I can't really get into the, the inside baseball of the s physics and science of what's going on, but the, the layman way that we explain to the, the uninitiated is it's like the box fan in your house, but in reverse. The box fan in your house, you're providing energy to the system to turn the thing, and it produces the wind that's coming off the fan. This works in reverse. The wind is hitting the blades to drive the rotor, and it's the spinning of the rotor that generates energy. Um, and then the, uh, the feeder lines that go to the step up and step down, or the, really the step up substations on site, uh, run down the length of the, the tower. And you know, most of the time it's underground. All of these components that we've talked about, what, what do I do? All of these components, everything from the hub to the, the motor to change the pitch on the blade to the motor to change the, the yaw or which direction the, the uh, wind turbine is pointing, all of these different things have sensors. We have SCADA systems. SCADA stands for uh, System Control and Data Acquisition that keeps track of all the data coming off these sensors, feeds it into databases, and that's where I pick it up and I manage it and serve it up to whoever needs it to learning algorithms that use it as an analysis to do all kinds of things with that data. And so I have to manage all of that data when it comes to production. Uh, this is a real life photo, I think not from one of our sites, I think I pulled this off the internet. Um, but you can, it's a good shot of the inside of, of a turbine, so you can actually see, you know, you, there's, there's a human there for scale, you can see some, these are there's some met equipment over here, it looks like anemometers or something. Um, and you, you can see how big that, 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 that rotor is, it's pretty, pretty huge. Uh, so, Fun facts to give you a sense of relative scale and stuff with regards to what's going on with turbines. So the pattern fleet, our just, just the fleet that's owned by our company, we're in the realm of 2,300 to 2,400 turbines spread across somewhere between 35 and 45 sites. I want to say we have 43 sites total, but some of those are solo sites. Um, it's somewhere between 35 and 40 wind sites, um, and all the vast, vast majority of those turbines right now are like a Siemens and G. Has a production capacity, a max capacity that we could produce of 2.3 megawatts. Um, so, as far as energy sources go, uh, average turbine in our fleet could generate 2.3. Average plant, if you average it out across all those turbines and all those sites, we talked about about 150 megawatts per plant, but that varies a lot. And that's why I put Sunzia here as a, a, a reference. Sunzia is our big, big, massive project right now. It is a, a wind farm located in New Mexico that represents the largest investment in renewable energy in the United States history. The whole farm is going to cost us about between eight and nine billion dollars when it's all said and done. Uh, but it is going to produce 3,500 megawatts. Uh, it's going to have a, a max production capacity of 3,500 megawatts, which is, we get into the energy sinks, roughly a third or a little more than a third of the entire energy usage of New York City. Uh, so you talk about the, the difference between when we say megawatts and megawatt hours. If a turbine has a 2.3 megawatt production capacity, that means if it spins at full production capacity for an hour, it will produce 2.3 megawatts worth of energy in that hour. So you talk about megawatt hour usage. That means if that city, in any given appliance or something, uh, or, or any given city, if it is running constantly for an hour at max usage, it will use X amount of, of megawatt hours. So your fridge uses 0.002 megawatt hours per day. So if you if you roughly, you know, I don't know what your high efficiency fridge or the fridge you're making, I don't know, but roughly 0.002 megawatt hours per day. So it's not using 0.002 megawatts per, per hour. It is 0.002 megawatts spread out across the entirety of the day. So you know, divide that by 24 hours, and that's how much you roughly use per hour on average for average household is about 10 and a half megawatts. New York City all told me this is about 11,000 megawatts a day. And I put San Francisco here, I didn't, until I was putting this presentation together, I didn't realize San Francisco uses actually a lot more energy than New York. I would not have guessed that. But interesting little tidbit. Um, 
Oh, this right here. Turbine seems to take is 14 megawatts. This is what I was saying when I uh, was referring to that offshore wind project in Japan. Um, there are these these 14 megawatt turbines. So your average turbine that you see, you know, off the highway is going to be a 2.3 is going to be in the realm of 100 meters tall. These offshore turbines that we are we're going to be the, I think the first companies to build these prototype turbines, the GE, these Alley 8 X's. Each turbine can produce 14 megawatts, so you know, roughly seven times as much energy as your average land turbine. And they are 260 meters tall, with a blade length of about 100, somewhere between 120 and 130 meters. You're talking roughly, convert meters to yards, it's about three football fields tall. And you have to have crews that go out there on a boat when there's problems, and they have to climb up these towers and then go up there and do work. It's a, a massive, massive undertaking. Uh, but So that brings us to turbine curtailment. I was driving on the highway and I saw turbines that were not running. Why weren't they running? Shouldn't they be producing energy? I stepped outside, there's wind. I felt it. Why aren't they running? There's a variety of reasons for that. Um, when we run a turbine at less, or when we run a turbine at less than its production capacity, or we stop it altogether, that is called curtailment or derating. The difference between curtailment and derating is curtailment is an outside source telling us, hey, you got to lower production or hey you gotta shut the turbine down. D rating would be us self-imposing, you know, noticing a problem or something like that and saying, hey we need to derate the turbine because it doesn't make sense to be running it at this production level right now. Why would this happen? There's a variety of reasons. The first one being weather. And to get into that, I'm gonna go forward a slide real quick here because I'm gonna take some water. This is what we call a power curve. In this case, this is an example power curve. This is not a universal power curve that does not describe every wind turbine in existence, but um, uh, this this represents the production expectation of a turbine at any given wind speed. Um, so you got wind speed in meters per second on the x-axis. You got power produced in kilowatts on the y-axis, uh, axis, and you see this this weird curve that's flat at the bottom here and it's flat at the top here. At the bottom here, we've got cut-in speed. And this, for, for this particular turbine, this example made-up turbine, uh, cut-in speed is three and a half meters per second. If the wind is lower than three and a half meters per second, it either means there's not enough wind to even spin the rotor at all, or you know, you, there's all these, all these sensors and systems inside the turbine itself. All those things use power. Maybe there's enough wind to drive the rotor and produce some amount of energy, but it's not more energy than the turbine is using, so we're better off just leaving the thing off and not, 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 not wasting the energy, not wasting the, the overhead of running the turbine or the, the cost of it, because it doesn't make sense to run it that low. Once we get to the cut-in speed, where we decide to run the turbine and produce energy, uh, as wind speed increases, rotor speed increases naturally, and we produce more energy as wind speed gets faster, up to a cap, in this case, about 14 meters per second. Between 14 meters per second and 25 meters per second for this imaginary turbine, we are running at max capacity. That's, that's the sweet spot. That's where we want to be between those, those two speeds. We're producing as much energy as we can. We're feeding it to the grid. Uh, you know, the, the ISO's buying it, balancing energy usage. Things are good. Um, when we talk about curtailing for weather, a big reason we would curta curtail for weather would be if wind speeds get over 25 meters per second. It is not in that case that the wind can't turn the turbine. It absolutely can turn the turbine, but it is either running, it, it, it's essentially running too fast to be safe. It might do damage to the components, components might be getting too hot, um, and the cost and the risk of running a turbine that fast for an extended period of time is not worth whatever energy it's gonna produce, and it's not gonna produce more than max capacity, so we're better off shutting the turbine down to avoid the potential cost of, of damage or, or whatever would happen from, from running it that fast for that long. Um, other reasons we would curtail or derate for weather would be extreme weather events, so you know, events that cause high winds, um, but then if there's uh, lightning storms, I know, didn't you see the, the viral video in the past six to eight months or so? There was a wind turbine, Mount Lavar, thank goodness, in Texas that uh, got struck by lightning, and the whole thing burst into flames and then fell apart. I wish I, I, wish I included, I thought they'd include a link to the video, because it's pretty scary. Uh, but look it up, look at like, like Texas wind turbine lightning strike. It is, it is really, really horrifying to look at. Uh, but you can imagine, when that happens, and the thing's on fire, and components are falling apart, how much more dangerous would it be if you had those giant blades spinning at however many hundreds of miles per hour, given their size, hundreds of miles per hour, we're talking about angular momentum. Uh, uh, you know, it's, 
it's really, really ridiculous and dangerous for that to happen. We have no way of knowing whether or not a turbine is going to get struck, but it's safer just to not let it go. So things like that are reasons we would curtail. Um, another reason we would curtail, this is a big one in my work right now because we've got some interesting projects going on, um, is wildlife, which surprises a lot of people. The big one, there's, there's a few different wildlife uh, curtailments that we would uh, see, but the big, big one right now is bats. Um, it just so happens that a lot of the areas where we build turbines are also home to large bat populations. They, they, they like those, they, those zones with high wind and flat land are really good for turbines, are, are apparently also good for, for bats. Um, and bats are, I think nationally, but definitely in, in most of our sites, uh, there are an endangered species that's protected. And so you can imagine if we had wind turbines running and a block or a murder of bats, I don't want to use bats, I should have looked it up after the last presentation. Uh, if a group of bats is they can't see that great. These things are moving really fast. They don't necessarily, they're not, uh, above a certain speed, they can't accurately echolocate it. Um, so if a, a group of bats flies through a wind turbine, a mushroom gets taken out, that's highly illegal. We get fined a lot, and we're damaging the ecosystem, which is you know, in complete opposition to our, our mission of you know, making the world more green. Um, so I, I say this is a big one for my day to day right now. We have a project going on where I think at 11 of our sites, we're installing a total of 55 cameras project, what's on is the base of turbines looking up into the sky, like up the tower of the turbine. Um, and we're running them 16 hours a day at night when bats are active. And what we're doing is we're working with a company that has developed AI, AI algorithms that uh, does essentially uh, image tracking on all that, that, that video feed. And it gives us data about, or it, it tracks bat flight paths, it tracks number of bats in and out of an area, and it's helping us come up with uh, you know, models for when should we curtail and when, should, when do we not have to curtail because we can more accurately predict the movement of bats. That allows us to run things more efficiently, produce more energy, um, you know, during times where there's, there's low risk of bats, um, which, is, which, is, which is good for everybody. Um, third one, I don't wanna, I gotta pick a little bit too inside baseball on this one in the last session, and if people aren't with questions about it, I'll get more into it. But uh, economic and market factors. The, the super, super quick version of this is, anybody here have, Robin Hood, like a day trading guy. Anybody trade stocks, is interested in finance, anything like that? I see, that, I see a nod back here. So the same way that you can go on the stock exchange and trade stocks, uh, you actually, most, it's not really super available to retail investors, but it theoretically is mostly institutional investors right now, but you can go on the energy market and you can trade energy. But instead of trading stocks, which would be units of a company, you actually trade megawatts. You, 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 you buy and sell units of energy as an abstract concept, which gets a little, a little but it is, it is the same market trading system that uh, we operate on when we sell energy to the grid. That market determines the price, in a lot of cases, we get for the energy we sell. We sell. Um, and so there are moments, depending on supply and demand and you know, other things, uh, where, let's say, I'm, I'm completely making up a number, I don't know, I'm trying to give you a sense of scale. Let's say that the average day-to-day -day price of a megawatt is $75. There are moments on any given day where the price might spike to five or six thousand dollars per megawatt. That's a huge, huge jump. By the, the, the same token, there are moments where it might dip down to zero or below zero. Below zero meaning, I'm gonna talk about a lot, huge driver of this is the, the ISO is trying to balance the grid. Um, if you've got more energy coming in than you've got people using, the ISO starts to say, hey, we don't need any more energy. Think about a case of like a nuclear power plant very difficult for a nuclear power plant to stop that reaction, to stop producing energy. So places like a nuclear power plant need to push energy into the grid. If you've got other people like us saying, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna keep pushing energy into the grid, the ISO is gonna say, well, we don't need that energy. In some cases, that might be a dangerous surplus of energy. That is gonna cost us. So it's where the, the market price of energy has now dipped negative because you're gonna have to pay us if you want us to take on that ex excess energy. Um, and in those cases, if it dips low enough, there's, there's, we can go a little bit negative and we still kind of hit bravery even with our, with our overhead, but if it dips low enough negative, we say, hey, curta curtail the, the turbines or shut them down. It does not make economic sense for us to keep running the turbines. Like I said, if people have more questions about that, we can get into it, but that's basically the gist. Um, the last one would be mechanical issues. Obviously, there's a massive mechanical failure, something like, like a main bearing failure, the thing can't spin anymore. The turbine is just off. In that case, it's not derated, it is busted, and we gotta fix it. 
But there are cases where uh, mechanical issues, we can still run the turbine, but it's not safe to run it at max capacity. So things like, like uh, the main, main bearing temperature is a good example. Certain uh, transmission, not like transmission line, but the gearbox transmission thing. Um, there's mechanical situations where we can run a turbine at half capacity, but we can't run it at full capacity until something gets fixed. And so those are these cases where we see races where that happens. Power curve. So the reason for the day. The reason for the day, uh, climate change. My technology. Um, so, like I said, we have a massive meteorology team of truly, truly climate change experts. Our head director of meteorology is a guy named Patrick Pyle. He led some of the like latest, within the last couple of years, research that came out of uh, Cornell University. He gave a big talk about it at our, we had a big uh, corporate meeting in San Antonio back in December. And he gave For today's purposes, for, for you guys to have a takeaway, uh, the effects of climate change on weather can be can be categorized in two categories. You got acute uh, like acute weather events and chronic weather events. Acute weather events would be extreme weather events, things like ice storms that shut down the, the Texas grid, things like hurricanes, things like tornadoes, things like extreme temperature. There's uh, a location in uh, like New Hampshire, somewhere out on the East Coast, within the last few months that recorded the lowest recorded temperatures in known human history. I think like standing temperature at the top of this mountain uh, with no people live, thank God, uh, before wind chill reached into the negative triple digits. It was ridiculously, ridiculously cold. That's an example of an acute weather event. Chronic weather events or chronic changes to the, the weather is more along the lines of what we're talking about when we say climate change. You know, things like rising average temperatures, melting of the ice caps, Changing temperatures are things that have an effect on barometric pressure. Barometric pressure has an effect on wind. So we care about it because it affects our production. Um, but also, chronic changes in the weather, chronic changes in the climate, affect the production of acute weather events. And we'll touch on that, I think, on the next slide or two slides from now. I've got some examples of how acute uh, weather events have changed. But so, if you walk away from today with one big takeaway from my presentation, it is the second and the, the second and third point here. I get told a lot when people find out I work for a renewable energy company. They go, "Oh my gosh, that's so cool! You're saving the planet. You must sleep really well at night." And it's kind of a downer, but it's an important distinction, I think. Renewable energy companies like Pattern are not saving the earth in the way you think we're saving the earth in the immediate term. And what I mean is, we are not doing carbon recapture, we're not pulling plastics out of the ocean, we're not replacing the ozone layer, we're not doing, we're, we're not engaging in any activities that actively reverse the changes we've already made to the climate. What we are doing, what we, what, what our place is in this, this uh, ecosystem is, is a, a double meaning word here, well, in, in the, but in the, in the energy ecosystem of, of uh, the country and of the, the world, our place is in setting a new standard and trying to improve the energy mix. We want to move the world away from non-renewables and to renewables because from a moral ethical perspective, uh, it reduces the ongoing damage we're doing going forward. It does not undo the damage that has already been done, but we want to reduce ongoing damage. Um, unfortunately, I think the, the earlier class was resonate with this as much, but I think you guys being a little bit older, you probably will. This is all still driven by capitalism. What that means is it's, it's driven by shareholders, it's driven by profits, it's driven by the free market. And I have a very, when I was prepping all of this, I, I met with our head of meteorology and had a great talk with him a few weeks ago. Um, and I was trying to get his take on all of this stuff. And he is, I guess, first of all, this is, this is one of the world leading experts in climate change. Uh, I felt much better when he was like, I am not alarmed about the climate. It is changing and it's not good and we should be taking better care of our uh, planet, but my involvement in the latest research tells me we're not all gonna die when we're 2040. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. Things are bad, you should care about it. I think people like Greta Thunberg are doing the world a good service, but you don't need to lose sleep at night. You can go to bed and, you know, you, you can one day have kids and, and things are gonna be okay. Um, but 
beyond that, um, one of the things he said to me was, the free market is always going to be the thing that determines what the energy mix looks like. And the free market is always going to say, may the cheapest energy source win. And has anybody here taken an economics, an economics class? Supply and demand, a couple of, yeah, okay. So, so you guys know, as supply of something goes up, the price of that thing, whatever the commodity is, is gonna go down. We have a, an infinite supply of wind, which is great. We do not have an inf infinite supply of coal or of natural gas or of any of these things. Um, and so right now, the energy mix, like as we saw for Texas, is like roughly 60% coal and natural gas right now. That's going to get more and more expensive. And as the you know, as wind turbine technology, as solar technology, as nuclear technology gets more and more efficient, that's only gonna drive prices down Renewable energy is only going to get cheaper. We're only going to see an improvement in the, the, the energy the, the, the energy mix of, uh, of the country and of the world. Um, so that is, that is the place that companies like Pattern have in, uh, in you know, the future fight against climate change. Um, the caveat I would add, I don't know if it's a caveat, but it's an, an interesting tidbit that, again, our, our head of meteorology is telling me is because sometimes leads to business decisions that moral, moral, morally ethically are not necessarily the best choice for the world, but they are the best economic choice. An example of this is there have been cases where we've scouted a site for a new plant. And uh, let's say we were going to, I'm, I'm making up numbers here, but I think this is another case. Uh, the site was intended to be a 100 megawatt site. We're gonna build turbines and we we're gonna have a, a max production capacity of 100 megawatts. And that was, based on pricing information, pricing quotes we got from a certain manufacturer, let's say it was GE. Well, let's say that another manufacturer, Vestas, which is another manufacturer of wind turbines, Vestas comes by, they hear about this project, they come by and they give us a proposal, and they say, hey, we're involved in a government program right now that allows us to subsidize to you the cost of some of these turbines. And in the long term, you know, the, the upfront cost of the, the site is lower, the long term profit is better, and they say, we can build 80 megawatts worth of turbines for you at this cost, and that's gonna drive profitability up because your upfront cost is low. In that case, we don't build the 100 megawatt site that you were planning on building. We build the 80 megawatt site, which contributes a little bit less to the overall improvement of the energy mix, but it's more profitable. Uh, so there's, it's an interesting dance of, you know, we have we have corporate ethics and we have our, our mission statement is driving the world towards greener energy, but at the end of the day, profits win, stakeholders win. Please do better than generations before you, I guess is the, the plea. Um, actually, yeah, as, as market share renewable companies grows, uh, you know, we reduce the amount of, of non-green energy sources. Um, this is, is some of that data I was talking about with regards to uh, climate change influencing the production of a heat weather event. Um, this is in the NOAA, government website, um, and I forget what NOAA stands for, there's lots of weather data and, and geological data out there. Um, this is it's looking at billion dollar weather events, so weather, acute weather events that cause at least, at minimum, a billion dollars worth of damage to infrastructure, homes, things like that. From 1980 to 1989, that whole decade, there's 31 billion dollar weather events, so just a total of $205 billion worth of damage in that decade, and almost 3,000 deaths, which is about 300 deaths a year. In the last three years alone, we had 60, so twice the amount of the entire decade of the 80s, we had $60 billion weather events. These prices, by the way, are the costs are controlled for inflation, so that's $205 billion of today's dollars, and $434 billion of today's dollars, uh, resulting in what that, almost 1,500 deaths, which is about 500 per year, last three years. This is not good. I don't have a good takeaway for you here, except, like I said, do better. Get involved in climate change efforts. Pursue career paths that are in renewable energy or in carbon recapture, those sorts of things. Um, and that's, this is, I think, my last slide before Q&A. The earlier class didn't really care because they were, you know, not really thinking about how they're going to that, but you guys, I imagine, some of
some of you have gotten accepted to schools and are trying to sign up for your paths. Uh, in wind energy and renewable energy, there, there are a ton of different career paths, everything from you know meteorology to, to legal and policy stuff to engineering to computer science, like what I do, to we have a we at Adam, we have a whole environmental team that focuses on uh, you know that they're involved in our, our bat curtailment projects, um, but they also are involved in uh, you know ecological efforts, they're involved in environmental lobbying. Our head of, uh, of uh, environmental at Pattern, every year she takes a bunch of her team on like an ecology trip to Africa, and they do a bunch of conservation efforts out in Africa and like research and stuff. Um, and then there's, there's tons and tons and tons of jobs working on these sites. You know, it, it, uh, it, being more hands-on is kind of your thing. You can work on wind turbines. You can you can work on on solar panels. Like there's tons and tons of career opportunities. Um, if you guys care about that. So you know when you're like driving and you see a field full of like the wind turbines, mm -hmm. is there any way they could like add more to make it more like densely populated, or would that reduce efficiency? Because they're really spread out. The, the short answer is it would in most cases if the site was planned correctly and they did the you know the correct uh, you know statistical measurements and things when they were planning the site, um, the based on the models and knowledge that we have. At least in Patter's case, uh, those sites, the, the location and distance between turbines on each site is uh, going to be pretty close, roughly speaking, to peak efficiency. Um, so, I mean, it is literally is there space? Probably. Would we be producing more energy more efficiently? Probably not. They chose the space they chose, like the, the, the geographical area they chose to put the turbines because it was determined to be a good spot for it, and they placed them the distances apart from each other that they did to maximize energy yield um, from the wind resource. Because you can imagine if you had if you had a solid wall of wind turbines backed by another solid wall of wind turbines, the first wall would be freaking cooking, and the second wall would you know get much much less of that wind. Um, and you also have to, have to remember wind directions change. Why we have a yaw motor that changes the direction of the turbines. You can't really just build a grid array of turbines and expect to get the most efficient production because you have to be able to have that room to control for what direction is the wind coming. Yeah. Uh, so in the future, as wind, you know, wind energy technologies develop, mm -hmm. uh, what sort of like, um, what do you think the future of wind technology will look like, both literally and figuratively, like, um. Like next generation uh, wind turbines to like, um, it, I mean, I, I, I guess it sort of depends what direction you're getting at with your question. Talk about like the design of the wind turbines. Either, either. Um, that's uh, that's pretty much, and I'm speaking a little bit out of turn here because I am not a wind turbine engineer. Um, but by, by by my understanding, that's pretty frequently going to be driven by you know the science of aerodynamics and, and, and physical efficiency of driving the rotor. Um, the same way that, you know, your, your parents probably have a box fan they bought in 1970, and it looks much different than the Dyson fan you could buy today. Those sorts of changes will come over time. As far as uh, how big these plants are, where they're located, uh, I, think, I think our, our site, our, the offshore site we're building in Japan, is a really good example of like that's going to produce a lot more energy per turbine and is not taking up any physical land space that seems like a really good use of space and as those sorts of improvements in the technology be made i think we you will see a shift towards more efficient use of space and uh, you know i think generally speaking i think the u.s is, is pretty or is part of my heart piss poor at this if you look at you know if we have highway interchanges that take up the same amount of space as entire cities in Italy, which is just a huge, huge waste of space. A lot of engineers, I think, in spirit are all about efficiency, but when you've got the wealth of physical space that we've got, I think it becomes very easy at the corporate level, the finance level, to throw up their hands and say, who 
care that we're using space even efficiently, and hopefully as the technology improves and uh, you know, maybe engineers grow spines, uh, <laughs> we'll move towards to better uh, better usage of space. Does, does that answer your question?
are some cases there are there are very legitimate uh, you know concerns about uh, you know how how is building the turbines going to affect my land during the construction phase? How's it going to affect my land during the maintenance phase? I have a lot of wildlife on my land. Is there so much wildlife that the, the you know bats and eagles and stuff like that? Is there so much wildlife that it's potentially dangerous for the for the ecosystem? There are a, a, a few valid reasons to be uh, to be potentially critical of the idea of building a wind farm or something like that. But I think a lot of like the really vehement uh, opposition you see comes from people who aren't giving it that much thought or just aren't very well educated on the issue. This, this might be a stupid question. Right. Have at it. We're just out of time. Sorry. Thank you all for listening. I hope you learned something. If you have any questions you want to ask me directly,